Sonic the Hedgehog, Undertale, Rick and Morty, My Little Pony, Radiohead, K-Pop, what do all these things have in common? They're popular, enjoyed by many, and yet they have a reputation for having terrible fandoms. Now how do these good works of art end up with bad fandoms? And why do people tend to harbor negative opinions of works that have bad fandoms? And does it really diminish the quality of the work? Let's find out. Hi there everybody, my name is Roman Kuhn, the host of the Starlight Variety Show, and today we're talking about fandoms, and not just about my fandom. Ah, yes. The state of fans in the 21st century is an interesting case, as we become ever more connected to groups we belong to through the power of the internet, the social dynamics of group culture and its effects on different works, and how we perceive said works, becomes ever more important to understand. Now, let's all start on the same page by getting the formal definitions out of the way. A fandom is a subculture composed of fans who delight in feelings of camaraderie with others who share a common interest. Members of fandoms typically are interested in even minor details and spend a good portion of their time and energy involved with this interest, as well as interacting with other members of the fandom. This is what separates a member of a fandom from a casual fan. Most people tend to point to the fans of Sherlock Holmes in the early 1900s as an example of the first modern fandom. People had public mournings after Sherlock was thought to have died. And then Star Trek in the 1950s is another great example of one of the first modern fandoms. And I think there's some value in seeing these as the first modern fandoms, but it's important to note that fandoms go even further back. The word fan is actually a shortening of the word fanatic, which appears in the English lexicon in around the 1500s. This word means being marked by excessive enthusiasm and often intense and uncritical devotion. This comes from the modern Latin word fanaticus, meaning insanely but divinely inspired. That's right. These terms originally pertain to worship and religion, which makes a lot of sense. If we define a fandom as a community sharing a common interest, then religious fandoms have been around for a long time. Can you think of any other groups of fans that have been around for a long time? Many similarities can be drawn between the long traditions of sports fans and modern geek culture fandoms. Among these, cosplaying, a gathering, and an obsessive nature and undying loyalty. In understanding these fandoms, we need to understand the different types of fans that make up these bad fandoms. From my own analysis, I've come up with a useful few. You will also find that these fandoms can have all different types of fans. Firstly, there are the obsessives. I feel as if his glowing light is always protecting me and guiding me and making all my enemies blue and edible. Behold, I am Pac-Man! These are the fans that take their interest to a whole nother level and dedicate large amounts of their energy to their interest in a fashion that is perceived as abnormal or unhealthy. Think about when Star Wars hit theaters and... Think about when Star Wars A New Hope first hit theaters in 1977. It was revolutionary, so it probably had a large impact on people and their love for science fiction. Couple this with the fact that there's such a huge universe to explore, and many other people to explore it with. Star Wars is such a beloved franchise in popular culture that I think that most people are tolerant of the Star Wars fandom, but some fans can be obsessive nonetheless. I would also lump into this category people obsessed with Japanese anime and manga. Lastly, a lot of music or celebrity fans fall into this category as well. K-pop fans, One Directioners, Beliebers, The Skeleton Click, people obsessed with any band who take their obsession to an unhealthy level. Secondly, you have the elitists. They're responsible for two different types of behaviors. Oftentimes, they are the types of fans who harass people outside of the fandom, telling that their interest is superior without respecting others' tastes and opinions. These fans are also guilty of gatekeeping, saying that their show or their band can only be enjoyed by true fans. To give you a couple examples, pretentious music fans, Radiohead, classical music listeners, Radiohead, people who hate popular music, and a lot of indie band fans. Gamer gay people. Or, if you're unfamiliar, people who harass women saying, You're not a real gamer. You're just a girl. <laughs> I think the reason people do this is that they feel the more exclusive a community is, the more special they will feel if they're a part of it. So in a way, by gatekeeping and establishing a hierarchy of true fans, they try to maintain some sort of status for themselves and make themselves feel superior. Rick and Morty. Jerry, you know this guy eats poop, right? Hey, I don't eat poop! You guys are always so mean to me! <laughs> <laughs> Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty. And I'm gonna need you to put them way up inside your butthole, Morty. My butt? Put them way up inside there, as far as they can fit. Oh, jeez, Rick. Rick and Morty. Uh, another good example is Undertale. These are different kind of games where if you criticize it, you're going to be crucified. You also have your cringe or your edgy kids. This is a big one for a lot of different things out there. And honestly, to me, it's just kids being kids. And these fans get a lot of bad rep for people who pretend that they didn't do any stupid stuff when they were kids. Mine con. It's the eye of the spider. It's poison. It won't bite. Uh, anime. 
make kids. <laughs> Uh, Sonic Kids. Uh, Emos. If you play guitar, you're not a musician, okay? You have to be hot, you have to be able to scream, and... Mm, uh. uh, Undertale people, Cuphead people. I don't really understand the whole Cuphead thing. I don't know why people say Cuphead has a bad fandom. Have you heard that? Yeah. You've heard that too? Why is that? I, I've never seen anybody on the internet. It's art. It, dude. In this fourth category, you have people who disagree with creators. If any work is ongoing and popular, a fandom can likely have these types of members. These are the people who think that their work is being ruined by questionable decisions. new additions to a franchise, or by people who like to create art inspired by the original work. A good example of this would be the new Star Wars movies and the backlash following the release of The Last Jedi. You have these neo-reactionary fans who make these edits with no women in it, and other fans who are like, It sucks! I don't want it in my canon! Also relevant is when Voltron spoilers are hit. A gay character died in Voltron, and the creators of the show were started receiving death threats from fans. There's a lot of entitlement going on here, with many fans feeling like they have some sort of ownership of this work. I understand caring about the story and the characters, but sending death threats is never okay. It's not never okay. I'll take it back. It's okay sometimes, but not always. Number five, terrible people. These are the worst kinds of people. These are people who do terrible things. They're not always products of whatever work that they are fans of, but they can be. For example, pedophile bronies. Connecting with other misfits over a show that preaches acceptance is cool. Being a pedophile is not. Or juggalos who commit violent crimes. Now it's gonna get tough on when you feel stuttered when you do I'm putting you in the car and all your blood's gonna splatter though I'm playing guys you get dick right in your ass from rest here for a while and I'm tired take it away it always stay. Yet the whip singer so fucking on you and my ears ring. It makes sense that these sort of fans would be attracted to a band whose themes include a lot of violence and antisocial behavior in their lyrics. A lot of these I'm not gonna go into but school shooter fandoms. Why do they even exist? Why? Why do they exist? Yes, on Tumblr. Bad Tumblr. Bad. <laughs> I'm serious, they really are there. <laughs> on Tumblr, people are like, oh, he's so handsome. <laughs> Isn't that weird? That's so weird. These suck. It's often hard to predict when these types of fans will show up, because them being fans of a show doesn't change that, at heart, these are terrible people. Everyone else I lump into a group called annoying people. These are fans that people consider obnoxious or unpleasant. Uh, some examples would be Rick and Morty. Uh, you know I'm talking about you Whovians. Uh, shippers, Slash Riders, Sherlockians, Supernatural fans. Now, I personally don't have a problem with many of these people, but a lot of people do, so I thought to include them anyways. To understand how these categories will be useful, it's first important to note that you can often predict what a fandom will be like given the nature of an artist's works and who it's supposed to appeal to. Let me give you some examples. Artists like One Direction and Justin Bieber, whose primary demographic is 13-year-old girls, are bound to have screaming 13-year-old girls in their fandom. Artists like the Insane Clown Posse, who glamorize violence and antisocial behavior, are going to draw violent and antisocial fans. Now, these are examples of bad works attracting bad people, but what about good works of art? Well, they are not exempt, and oftentimes we see fans be a mixture of the aforementioned categories. For example, Star Wars has built a massive universe with so much to explore, that's why you'll find obsessives, but it's also an ongoing franchise, and the creators make risky moves, so the fandom sometimes lashes out in a toxic way. So now that we understand how a bad fan base can arise from a variety of works, let's try to figure out why people tend to have a negative opinion of works with bad fandoms. Oftentimes on the internet, you'll encounter people who dismiss something solely based on who likes it, even though they haven't actually experienced it for themselves. While it might sound a little ridiculous, on some level, I see why this makes sense. Think about this, there's so much entertainment out there. There's so many video games to play, movies and TV shows to watch, music to listen to, books to read, so how do we figure out managing what things are worth experiencing if we haven't experienced them yet? Well, we look at what other people have to say. What's the score on Metacritic? What's the Rotten Tomato score? What's the rating on Goodreads? But not only do we get our recommendations from critics, as their taste can be different from the average entertainment fan, we also get our recommendations from our fans and what the internet has to say as well. If something is popular on the internet, I want to understand the jokes, or if all my friends are watching The Office every night, I want to be part of it. It all goes back to the feelings of belonging and community. 
If you see someone different from yourself, or someone who you perceive as weird or annoying liking something, you're probably going to assume that since you're very different from them, you probably have different tastes from them. And whatever they like is meant for weirdos or annoying people like them, and not for superstars like you. The best example of this is my brother August. He thinks that just because I watch anime, and I'm a freaking weirdo. <laughs> Pineapple custard pudding! That all anime is weird and for freaking weirdos. But guess what, August? You So who's a weirdo now? So when we see stuff like this. I hate when people underestimate my fastness. I'm fast. I'm so fast, you couldn't even comprehend how fast I am. We can be quick to assume that the song of the Hedgehog is not worth our time, but holy sh! The music, the visuals, the gameplay, it's all amazing. And if you're overlooking such a great experience because of a few bad apples, that's a real internet. I think another part of this is the effect that the internet has on how we perceive things. The internet decides whether you do or you don't like something. It will make fun of you until they've run out of jokes and then it will find its next target. This has a lot of power deciding what people like, since most people would rather steer clear from something if it meant that they could establish themselves as superior instead of being at the butt of many jokes. It's the same deal with Minecraft. One look at memes that come out from Minecon you think this game is for weird children. But holy crap, Minecraft is an incredible experience with C418 on the soundtrack and the ability to build whatever you want and have fun with friends. A lot of these art mediums are social things and we are naturally social creatures. So it's harder to enjoy things while feeling that you don't belong to a group. Now, does it truly diminish the quality of the work? In almost every case, I'd say a bad fandom does not <laughs> But, 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 this is an important question, and there is a counter-argument to be made. First, let's take a look at some examples where it doesn't ruin the quality of the work. This would be in scenarios where you're not required to interact with other fans to enjoy work. For me, this is single-player experiences, movies, TV shows, books, music, pretty much everything. So, what is the exception to the rule, then? Well, when you're forced to interact with other fans to enjoy something, and those fans aren't very pleasant, that can definitely ruin your experience. Here are some examples. Fortnite is an amazing game. But if you're forced to interact with an army of kids who watch Jake Paul, ah, God, bro. I got you, baby, I got you. Hey, hold tight. Don't panic. You might not enjoy it as much. League of Legends and its toxic community. Call of Duty. Shut up, mom! I'm playing! Oh, oh I, I'm a fuck. What, what, what do you want me to do? You tell me you want me to fuck you. Stand for you fucking bad. Uh, sports fandom sometimes, depending on who you are. Sometimes music concerts or other hobbies that you don't have to, but you want to enjoy with others can be ruined. For many people, the social aspect of music listening plays an important role. For that reason, a bad fanbase can really make some people less enthusiastic to participate and celebrate an artist's work. A bad fanbase can make you question whether or not you want to be labeled as someone who belongs to a group of people like that, especially when it's very common to ask somebody, hey, what kind of music do you listen to? Okay, let me tell you, I've enjoyed a lot of entertainment throughout the years. And even being aware of all the bad fans on the internet, I can tell you Sonic Mania is a fantastic game. Arctic Monkeys is a great band. The Star Wars movies are great. Undertale is a fantastic game. Cuphead's a fantastic game. Both of these indie games have more people complaining about the fandom than are actually bad people that are in the fandom. Now for something I've been avoiding talking about. Furry culture. Alright, listen up idiots. I will fight anybody who says furry culture is inherently bad for several reasons. Research shows that groups like furries benefit from interaction with like-minded others in a recreational environment, which leads to a higher self-esteem and greater satisfaction. For these people, their fursona is a way of expressing themselves, and their fursuits make it easier to socialize without the fear of being judged. Their art is a creative way of expressing themselves, and there's nothing wrong with that. Look at all this great art. Yeah, you idiot. How could you defend something that has so much porn drawn of it? Well, tell me, internet troll. What do you like? Well, I like Animal Crossing. Try finding some porn of that. <laughs>